It's my pleasure. Really. <laughs> thank you, Laurent, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for the invitation here. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so okay, that I'm going to talk about this. I should say first that this is uh, this is joint work with uh, with Peter Schneider. And also, I should say that this is work in progress, and I. I want to emphasize that this is work in progress because I have to say that at this point it's still a little bit hard for us to find um, the right narrative to uh, to present um, our results. Um, so there, because there's still a lot to do uh, to in about this heck algebra, we still have a lot to unravel and 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 there's a lot to do before we can actually draw concrete consequences for the mod p representation theory of Fiati groups and potentially the mod p Langlands program. But yet, uh, today I'd like still to convey the idea that this derived Heck algebra is, is a rich object in itself, and, and, that, and that it's likely to, to shed some geometric light on the, the potential uh, uh, mod p Langlands correspondence. So our goal is to study, uh, we're going to take a, a Piatti group, and we want to study its mod p representations. Um, so it's a, it's a group of f points of well, bold G, which we take uh, connected reductive group over F. And we're going to suppose, it, I guess, F split. At some point, I might even say that it's semi-simple, just to make things easier, or so that I'm sure that what we say is, is true. Um, so F will be a finite extension, or potentially also if Q are joint T, where Q is a power of P, as usual, I mean, my O will be the ring of integers, uh, pi your uniformizer, and P maximal ideal of F. Um, that's all. And FQ is O over P. So the goal is to understand the, the, the mod P representations of, of that group. And in general, if I take K, an algebraically closed field of of any characteristic, I'm going to denote by rub k of g the category of smooth representations. So if k is c, this is called the classical case, and, and in that case, the, the, the category is, 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 is well understood. I mean, yeah, we, and, and this is called the classical case, and the local Langlands correspondence is uh, well understood. When k equals f l bar for l different from p, this is also, I say, fairly well understood. These irreducibles are well understood, and, and we'd say that we're fairly satisfied. But when we take k equals f p bar, then we don't really know what happens. So in fact, when f equals f p bar, what is known at this point is what is well understood. It's a representation theory. Of, of GL2QP and, and, and even SL2QP, in fact. And the mod P Langlands correspondence for GL2QP is, is established by work of Colmes <coughs> and Pasfunas and, and others. So in that case, things are, are okay, but for the rest, for other groups, everything is mysterious. Even if you take GL to F or F different from QP, it's still a, a big question mark. So, so I'm going to uh, start explaining how heck algebras show up in this context. So uh, in general, if you take Y an open compact subgroup of G, you can always uh, look at, the, at what I'm going to call XY, which is the compact induction of the trivial character of y that you can also see <coughs> as the function that are right invariant under the action of y and with compact support in g. So for example, if you take y equals k, sorry, k be being you know, the maximal compact, um, well, you get, you get here, like g, g over k here as an affine Grissmannian. And you can take also um, y, the Iwahari subgroup that I'm going to denote by I prime, because in fact, I'm going to be more interested in its Propicillo subgroup. 
So if you on this one, if you reduce mod the uniformizer, you end up with the group FQ points of G. And here you get a Borel subgroup. If you reduce its propicilo, you end up in the unipotent subgroup of that Borel subgroup. And in that case, G over I prime is in a fine flag variety. I mean, over a piadic, say, a fine flag variety. So we are going to work more in, with that case. And somehow, so, so it's just a tiny bit bigger. It's like a torus bigger than the, this a fine flag variety, just to fix the ideas. Um, OK, so, so HY. So once you have this, you can take the algebra of endomorphisms as a G representation of XI. And usually, we take its opposite which uh, by Frobenius reciprocity is, can be identified with the y invariant, y by invariance functions with compact support over G, uh, on G with, with convolution product. And this is the Heck algebra associated to y. So um, today I'm going to explain how, why we are interested in, in studying derived versions of those. In fact, in the, in the talk of Niccolo Roncari, you already uh, heard about the derived version in the case when y equals k. And today I'm going to talk about the case when uh, y equals i for motivated by other things. Why, why do you take the opposite? Uh, you know, just because why not? Uh, just because it makes... <laughs> <laughs> It makes sometimes it makes it easier. I mean, it's just uh, it it's not really it's just a choice. Uh, and for some things, it makes it easier. Um, so so first those those uh, those Heck algebras. Uh, well, they're they're like I mean I was trying to hint at the fact that they have a geometric uh, meaning. And in in general, you can look at I mean just as a, as just a quick remark here. You can always look at the at the at the y covariant. Uh, constructible sheaves over G mod Y, which contains a perverse sheaf. Let's say, uh, let's say we work over C here. It's just, it's just a, a, a general remark here that I mean, I'm not an expert on these things, but I can. I mean, there's nothing specific. I'm just saying here that if you, if you, if you, um, if you pull back to a point and then you take all the characteristic, you get some. You get the Heck algebra. So if you if you decategorize this category, you get the Heck algebra. So somehow many properties of a, of Heck algebras are, are actually a shadow of something a little deeper. And an ex a, a famous example of that is the case when you gain you can k equals c and you can f equals f q. I join T, just to be safe. Uh, I take Y, the maximal compact. Sorry. It's G of O. I mean, this is the K, the one I called K before. Well, in that case, the category of, of, of Y equivariant perverse sheaves on the affine Grossmannian, so here y equals k, is, is equivalent, as we know, as to the representations of the dual group of G. And this, when you take growth and uh, ring, so when you, you, you do this transformation here, well, you end up exactly with uh, the <laughs> Satake isomorphism that says that the Heck, the Heck algebra of y when y equals k is isomorphic to the invariance sorry, under the finite wild group of the group algebra of the co-character of the tor of a split torus of of g and this is the the the, the growth and degree of the representations of the dual group, right? So this example, I mean, this in the case of the geometric Satake giving us the, the well-known Satake isomorphism is an example where a property of the Heck algebra is a shadow of something uh, that has, you know, that, that is more geometric and deeper. 
So somehow, uh, today I'm going to talk about another way to enhance the structure of the Secchi algebra, not by looking at preserved sheaves, but rather uh, by um, uh, deriving it. And a, a long-term dream would be to actually relate those two perspective on things. Um, so why do we uh, bother about, uh, about those Hecke algebras? So link between in general, HY and, and the representations of the group. Well, we always always have a functor that I call H0 from the category of representations of G into the category of, of left uh, HY modules, because I took opposite. Uh, taking V to its Y invariant subspace, and it has a left adjoint T naught from that takes in a module and gives you a representation of G. In fact, it gives you a representation. I'm going to add a, a, an ex, um, a Y here to say that this means that this is the representations. that are generated by y fixed vectors, by their y fixed vectors. So it's, <coughs> a, it's, a, it's a subcategory of the whole category. And you take a module m, and you tensor it on, on this side by the universal module over hy. So universal module with here. OK. So if, um, if the pro order of y is invertible in k, then, then, <coughs> then h is exact. So we expect a link between the two categories, or, or this one and that one. And indeed, when k equals c and, and y equals y prime, then by result of Bernstein, um, the category, this mo this, these functors are uh, quasi-inverse equivalents of categories. And and we have a nice, uh, a category, uh, an equivalence of categories between, sorry, with an I prime, between this subcategory and the category of modules over the Hecke algebra. So of course, when we take K equals F P bar, <coughs> well, everything here would fail because G is locally a pro P group. So for, for none of those choices of y, well, we have an exact functor. And yet, we feel like taking y equals i, because it's, it's, it's the biggest pro p silo subgroup. And why do we take it pro p? Because, well, because bec precisely because we work in characteristic p, we know that if v is a non-zero representation, then its i invariant subspace will be non-zero. So that's already something. H, the functor here is, is not exact, but it sends a non-zero representation to something non-zero. So that's, that's already uh, well something that a, a positive thing. So that's the case we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, starting from now. From now on, k is f p bar, and I'm going to take. <laughs> I'm just going to write. Uh, sorry. So y is going to be i, the pro p Wahari subgroup. Uh, I'm going to just write, write x instead of x i and h instead of h i. And the goal is to understand the link between 
the category of representation of H module and the category of representations over FP bar of G. Um, okay, so maybe I'll make a few um, a few comments uh, first about what is known. Just a quick word about this H here. So here in the complex setting, uh, HI prime is very well known to be a, a standard, a fine Hecke algebra with parameter Q, where Q is the image of, of uh, the, the cardinality of the residue field into C, so it's not zero. Well, here this is the same, except that Q now maps to zero in characteristic P. So it's some kind of a fine version of a zero Hecke algebra. This is, this is what this object is. So what is known about that, so remarks, well, first, when G equals SL2QP, well, the, we know that uh, the category of H module is, in fact, equivalent to the category of representations of G over FP bar that are generated by the I-fixed uh, vectors. And, in fact, it's also known for SL2QP by work of Carol Koziol. But it's not true and I'm going to just <coughs> say a word of why, it, I mean where it fails and why this doesn't work. Um, so for this I need to uh, introduce uh, a family of modules called supersingular. So for any G, nah, any group G, there is a family of finite dimensional H modules called supersingular that seem to play a role in the potential mod P Langlands correspondence, even if you know at this point it seems a little weak. I mean it's it's a, it's you know there is uh, it's very combinatorial data. What are these things? Uh, in fact they are easy to define if I mean H is happens to be finitely generated over its center. And its center contains an affine semigroup algebra. So it's really because I work in characteristic P here. The, so the, the group algebra of the dominant co characters of the torus is finitely generated here. And a supersingular module, um, a module is called supersingular if basically those elements here act. I mean, any non-invertible non element here acts by zero, acts by zero. So for example, when G equals SL2, it's very easy to, uh, to see that. I mean, the, the picture is just H contains its center, finally generated over the center, and the center contains a polynomial algebra in one, in one uh, generator. And M finite dimensional is super singular. I mean, in fact, I don't need to say it's super singular if, if and only if M is of zeta torsion. I guess I can say if it's finite. So this is the definition for SL2, the definition of super singular, and well, <coughs> you can generalize it. So what about those super singular modules? Well, first, when, when G equals GL2QP, then in the, in the equivalence of category above, the, the supersingular modules correspond to uh, the supercuspidal representations. So that's that's very nice, but um, it's for when when S equal, when G equals S S U Q P, there is a kind of bijection like that with involving packets. I'm done doing. So again, it's reminiscent of. Uh, oh, sorry, that's not what I should say. Uh, sorry, it's not here. Okay, not here. Um, 
Okay, it's also true for SL2 QP. Um, but this fails. So when G is different from GL2 QP or SL2 QP, there are, I should say, more supracuspidal representations than super singular module. So what does this mean more than? It's because if you fix uh, the if you fix the, the 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 action of a uniformizer and you make it make it I mean you decide that the uniformizer is going to act by a scalar, you fix it, then you can count there is a a, a, a finite number of super singular modules. It's actually finite, and yet by work of of, of Breuil and Pascunas, you can build infinite families of of supercuspidal representations. So. So this correspondence uh, won't work. And, and yet, to, f to finish about, about this, when G equals GLN, F, F different from QP, <coughs> the, the super singular modules, even if, well, because it's already not true here, I mean, when, sorry, I should say here, yeah, when G equals GL2F, F different from QP. Sorry, it's not true in that case that a super cuspidal representation gives you a uh, yeah, actually, it's like uh, yeah, uh, I, it's actually I proved it recently in a paper with uh, Marie France. So yeah, 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 it's true. True, it's true. Actually, that yeah, that supercuspidal gives you super singular. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in general, what can we say? Uh, in general, it's, it happens that the, the super, the super, as at least for GLN, the super singular, simple super singular modules with dimension n are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the irreducible and dimensional representations of the Galois group of f. So it seems to indicate that for the Heck algebra, there is a kind of Langlands correspondence. It's just a, it's a bijection. It's actually now induced by a functor by work of uh, Elmar Grosse-Cloner. Uh, for SLN, that's what I was trying to say before. For SLN, it's not like that a um, one-to-one correspondence. There is like a, a bijection uh, induced by uh, with involving packets by work of Kozul. So it seems that the super singular modules, independently of what happens for the group, because when we relate it to them to the re relate them to the group, the correspondence seems to fail. The super singular modules seem to carry some kind of n number theoretic uh, uh, information. So what to do with that? Uh, this is what uh, we work on, and this is and the fact that they seem relevant here is what motivates us to uh, continue studying this uh, Heke, Propi Wahari Heke algebra, even if we know that there is no um, equivalence of category on, on the on the level of, of of the actual genuine representations here. So that's why we're going to uh, derive the picture. Um, So the, f oh yeah, and I should say lastly that when I said that for a GL2 f f different from QP, the the, the equivalence of category <coughs> is not true, because for example t0 is not exact, and the exactness of t0 fails exactly at the super singular points. So it's a, it's a result by Schneider already in 2007 that tells us that it's probably relevant to derive this picture. And so. He works in the case where uh, f is a finite extension of QP and i is torsion free, so that it's a Poincare subgroup. A Poincare group, group sorry, of, of dimension d. So there is a, a total right derived functor. So when I derive H0 
from the category of derived, I mean, derived category of unbounded complexes of representations of G in, in FP bar vector spaces into the derived category of just vector spaces. So this exists. And his goal was really how, how to compute that. So to, to say more about this functor, um, he decided to derive the picture on the Hecke algebra side. <coughs> so in fact, to do this, we can take any f. It doesn't need to be, we don't, for this, it doesn't matter that i is, is a Poincaré group. So what, what to do here, well, you can pick a, so x is the compact induction of the trivial character, and we can take an injective resolution of it. And then define the differential graded Hecke algebra by taking the endomorphism algebra of this. So H dot is the graded endomorphisms of, uh, in the category of smooth representations of G of I dot, and I guess we take the opposite again, why not? So it's a Hecke G -G -G A with, with, the dif with differentials and the multiplication. So the cohomology of H, H dot, is actually, it's, I mean, it's a classical resource to prove that the cohomology of H dot is the X algebra. <laughs> So in particular, H0 of H dot is the standard, I mean the H0 H dot is hum from X into X, so it's just H. And so the theorem, I guess I can write the theorem over there. is that there, is, there exists a functor H that makes the following diagram commute. So that's the original, this is a right derived functor of H0 here. This is a forget functor makes this diagram uh, commute up to a, a, a natural isomorphism. I'm sorry, your notation for H dot, there are two dots on the right hand side. It's just NG. I mean, what is indexed uh, in NG uh, dot yeah. or I dot? Sorry, here? Yeah, it's just I dot and you take the uh, Are, are no, there two indices or what? Yeah, uh, you take the this is a graded uh, the, uh, uh, morphism. F I mean, this is the, let me think, uh, I guess. I mean, oh, I, get, uh, I guess, uh, I guess, no. I mean, I guess this is just a notation, but yeah, this is the endomorphism. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so why did I, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's a functor that makes this diagram commute and, and, and most importantly, H is an equivalence of a triangulated category. So at this point, it he felt like, OK, there we go. This is what we wanted. We wanted an equivalence between <coughs> Hecker modules and, and representations. Turned out that it fails if we don't look further. But if we derive, well, there is, there is an equivalence of derived uh, categories there. The problem is that uh, at this point was, what are these objects concretely? And this is what we are working on. Like, wh is, is how can we concretely um, I mean, 
fi find information on our genuine representations, starting from there. So the questions after that were, were what is, what is G? It's a little easier because it's more combinatorial. What is this? A little easier is what is the cohomology algebra <coughs> of this. So this is what we, what I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, this is what we, we are working on right now. I mean, this is our starting point. And I'm going to now give you some results that we get ab about this, uh, this uh, cohomology algebra and um, try to kind of justify why we are excited about those results, even if, again, I don't have like a, a concrete consequences yet on, on, the, on the general picture that I introduced before. So starting from now, I can take any f, oh. again, possibly a positive characteristic. And, and well, there, there, what can we say? A few things I can say about this cohomology algebra. I guess I can write it E star. Uh, well, yeah, this is the derived category of differential graded modules over this Hecker DGA. This is very, uh, no, well, that's going to be just anything. Yeah. So, um, all right, so maybe a quick word about the technique and why, why, I mean, why it takes us time to, it took us time to figure out why. So what are, what are elements here? Well, first, the first thing we can, we can see is that the, by, by, by Frobenius reciprocity and because inducing the <laughs> specs injectives. Um, so this object here, which is, which can be seen as, so this is uh, H star, I mean, this is X star G of X into X, but this can be seen as H star of I into X. And then we can index the double cosets of G mod, I by a, a slightly bigger um, val group than the usual fine val group uh, and val group, and it turns out that if I decompose x as an i representation into the direct sum of all the x w, where x w <coughs> is the functions that have supports in i w i. Then, then cohomology here will commute with this direct sum. <coughs> and, and this is the same as the direct sum by Shapiro lemma. This is the same as, as the direct sum of cohomology of the group IW, where IW is the intersection of I with WI. W minus one. So there, that's the way to look at elements in there. We can decompose and look at them as elements in here, which means like for H1, for example, they're very concrete. We can compute them. We, we have a, a good grasp. I mean, we had to do a lot of calculations already in the case of SL2, but this is fairly concrete. Um, this description also tells you that you ha since you have a cup product on, on you know, H I of IW with HY of IW, it means that there is a, a cup product that we denote by, by this also on, on E star that comes from each the cups, cup products here. So, okay, that's good. Uh, the only thing is like this description does not really allow us to see the, the product. The product is, gi is given by Yoneda uh, product. So, I don't know if... Uh, Maybe there is no point uh, explaining that, but I mean, the, the fact that, anyway, that was one of the first <coughs> challenging challenges was to understand the product in this, in this algebra, even if concretely it was easier for us to think of the elements in there. So for example, one result I can say about the product is 
first is that we do have the formula for it, so we understand now the product in our algebra. And <coughs> let's say zero, uh, we understand. I mean, we understand. We have the formula, explicit formula for the UNIDA product in E star. And for example, if I take uh, two elements in the Weyl group, now we know that, I mean, we can prove that HI of I X of V times something in HI of I <coughs> X of W will end up in HI plus J of I of something with support in I, V, I, W, I. OK, so that's not a, a big surprise. But for example, something that was nice and somewhat unexpected that we fi found is like if the length behave nicely, they add up like that, then so if if uh, let's say if alpha is in the first one, and beta in the second one, so it turns out that alpha dot beta that lands in and here, according to what I just said above, well, the formula for this is actually just the right action of the characteristic function of i, w, i on A, which is, in fact, the product in the, in the, in the Komaji algebra of alpha by this element that lies in H. So it lies in H0. In H, cup product with the left action of I W, the characteristic function of I W I acting on beta. So we're just saying these are like formulas that we find that we 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 were surprised by, and we feel like again, no, I, I can't really comment yet on why it's going to be useful. But for us, it was a, a nice. It was very nice to see that we can simplify the expression of the product and get a good grasp on it. All right. And now, a little bit more interesting. Something else that we found about our derived Heck algebra is uh, we found an anti-involution. of E star. And it's actually very easy to describe what it is, because if I take W, an element in there, then, well, I, W minus 1 is nothing but the conjugate of I, W by W minus 1. And therefore, I have a natural map induced by conjugation from H, I of I, W, K into H i of i w minus 1 k, okay, sending c to a co-cycle to c w of w something w minus 1, basically. And this, we said, is just a piece of E star. This is another piece of E star. So I get an isomorphism here that I denote by JW and summing over all the Ws, I get, well, first an involutive uh, linear map. And the theorem is the following. J is an 
involutive anti-isomorphism of the graded next algebra E star So meaning precisely that j of alpha dot beta is minus 1 to the power i plus j, j of beta, j of alpha. Okay, so we have this involution. So again, for us, it's quite convenient for practical purposes because we're trying to already, for in the case of SL2, we're trying to compute this exactly, I mean, possibly give generators and relations of E star. So having so something like that is quite useful. And as a side note, because at the beginning, I, 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 I said that potentially we would like in the end, in the long-term dream, to relate this, this to, to more, a more geometric perspective. Right. It should be noted that, for, for example, I, I mean, I, I said that in the context that if we think of geometric satake and the category of perverse sheaves, well, the category of perverse sheaves is also endowed with, with an involutive, uh, I mean, with an involution, anti-involution like that, uh, we can, I can call it J. And, and um, in that context, um, taking Verdier dual or taking the anti-involution J on perverse sheaves, either, I mean, if you compose them, you can compose Verdier dual with that inv involution in one way or another, and these, these, this is how you obtain duals, adjoints, in the category of perverse sheaves. So this, the, this involution exists in the, con in the geometric context, and in fact, also in the geometric context, the, the, the involution J um, if you project it back in the decategorified level on the Heck algebra, this coincides with the usual anti-involution sending characteristic function of k g k to characteristic function of k g minus one k. And here, sure enough, if you uh, restrict it <coughs> to h, j is just the map that's an a i characteristic function of i w i to characteristic function of i w minus one i. <coughs> so, so this involution is a good sign for us. And I'm going to explain even more why it's uh, interesting because it shows up. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. This is like composing with the inversion of the group, yeah. But it was not clear for us that this would give, give us, I mean, I guess, you know, I guess, yeah, I mean, yeah, now we say it, yeah. It was not cl completely clear. I mean, we had to prove that, I mean, how, I mean, th this thing here was not completely trivial for us. So the fact that it, c it, it coincides with this, I mean, we needed that. Yeah. Um, So something else that we found out about this uh, algebra is the fact that in the case where, so now we go back to the case when i is torsion free, so I need to make some restrictions. For example, f, f over qp, f is a finite extension of qp, and p is big enough depending on the group you, you take. For example, p greater than 5 if you work with SL2 qp. Um, so here, by Lazare and Say, uh, I is a Poincaré subgroup, Poincaré group of dimension D. Um, so I'm going to define a trace, map, like some kind of trace map S. So this is something that lies in the dual of X. And what it S is just the sum of all the for all g of over a of the evaluations of g and si is the the map it induces on cohomology 
so there is a first an easy lemma that is just Poincaré duality that says that if I take i between 0 and d, then the cup product induces a non-degenerate pairing between h i and h d minus i into h d of i into x. And then with s d, I can send this into h d of i into k. Uh, X is the is the S K of G. I mean this one. Yeah. So this is iso. I can fix an isomorphism eta of uh, with this to K. So first the lemma says that this is not a non-degenerate pairing, but this is just Poincaré duality. So it, so we, and therefore we have a map, a linear map from h i of i into x into the dual of this. So this dual here, this is the dual of a direct sum. So this is the product of all the. This is the product of all these, of all the, the duals here. And it contains what we denote by the finite dual. So finite dual, which is the direct sum of all these. Uh, uh, like here? Yeah. yeah, so because, so in fact, this is, as I, I mean, I was a little fast for here. We have, so here, the uh, an element here, we decompose it as a direct sum. But on each of these, I, I can identify this with, with this here. So now I have a cup product. a cup product here, which I can lift, I mean, bring back to here and say that I have a cup product between uh, and so I define so this is why I said at the beginning that that in E star we have a we have a cup product because we have a, we have a cup product between these elements and then we have a cup product defined component by components and we decide it's going to be zero between uh, you know if W is not W prime and then the cup product between two components is zero so this is this is the cup product I'm talking about and this is the one here and that's why here by here I mean I first decompose here an element as a direct sum indexed by W and I take the <coughs> cup products in this sense. Um, all right. So, okay, so we have this non degenerate pairing induced by the cup product. So therefore, we have an injection of h i into the dual of h d minus i. And what I want to say more precisely first is that the image of this, of, of this uh, injection is, in fact, not the whole dual, but the finite dual. But in fact, I'm doing this say better than this. And so this, this map here. Uh, yields and 
as an injective morphisms of H by module. So that's the that's thing that I'm adding here. It's not just a linear map from H i of i x <coughs> into the dual. But it's the twisted dual. So I have to twist. I have to make it. I make it the left action by taking the right action and twisting it by the entire involution j, and likewise on, on the other side. So this is a bi module by h bi module twisted by j, the involution, the entire involution on both sides, and it has image. With image, the finite dual here. And the, the twist, the twisted finite dual. <coughs> okay, so in particular, what it means so to check this, the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a morphism of twisted <coughs> of, of bi module with the twisted structure here, it means that as S D, the, the the trace map on 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 the Comar GHD of tau alpha tau prime cup beta is equal to S D of alpha cup J of tau beta J of tau prime for any tau tau prime in H alpha in H I and beta in H d minus i. So again, before I was saying that the, the, j, the j map on, on uh, the j involution of, on sheaves had something to do with the existence of, of duals of, and of, of adjoints. And here, our, our j again shows up. I mean, this is just a vague comment. I'm, not, I'm just saying that, that again, this, this tells us that there are some similarities and, and possibly um, something deeper behind our j here shows up as some kind of adjoint for, for the cup product. As a, as a consequence of this, we're able to uh, figure out a couple more concrete things. So for example, as a consequence, we can completely analyze the top cohomology or at least say many things, top cohomology. So again, I is still torsion free. And we can prove that, so HD as a bimodule is the, the direct sum of the trivial character of H plus um, something that is a union of super singular modules. Meaning finite a union of finite dimensional super singular modules. For SL2, it meant that HD was a direct sum of the trivial plus something that was zeta torsion, this zeta element that I had introduced. And, and, and but this is true in general, actually. I mean, I just finished the proof yesterday in the plane, so I'm <laughs> happy that it's true in general. And um, um, uh, yeah, so there we go. Um, so yeah, and our super singular modules show up here. So for the, this is dual, this is sort of dual to H0. In H0, we never have any finite dimensional sub representations. So, but in HD, we do. We have the trivial already, but everything else is super singular, which, which is quite nice. So trivial tr the trivial character that sends a that sends a um, characteristic function of i w y to zero if the length is uh, is is at least one and otherwise uh, one w one to one if the length is zero. This is uh, I guess this is just uh, you know you d usually this is this one right? Yeah, I guess this is this there. This is this one except mod p. Um, or maybe there is a minus Q usually? No, it's just Q. Yeah, it's just Q. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to stop here. So we, we, we are making more calculations. In particular, we would like to really see uh, concretely, I mean, like really, for example, retrieve the results of, you know, as you know, for SL2 QP, uh, SL2 QP there is an equivalence of categories. Can we see that using just a derived Hecke algebra? In some sense, we've kind of seen it already in a, in a past work. We've already managed to reprove this equivalence of category using a torsion pair in the category of, mod of, of Hecker modules. And already there, something happened. I, we managed to retrieve the, this result and the, the, by, you, by computing H1. So uh, we could read on the H1 uh, that behave differently for QP or for not QP. And just in studying H1, we managed to, prove, to reprove the equivalence of category and prove that otherwise it fails. But somehow, what we had done back then, we were not able to generalize it to, uh, to, to groups with higher rank. So we have more hopes now that we are starting to understand the whole machinery of this derived Hecke algebra. And we're trying to you know, continue. I mean, we have many other questions that we ask ourselves, but here are a few results. I think I'm going to stop here. It's my time. Thank you for attention. <laughs>